Jesus we are happy and free because we're bound for regions of everlasting song. Serving Him fully gives us full victory. So leave your sorrows and come with me. Why should she your children of God be sad? Lift our voices and happy to be changed. Things are not bad. Things are not bad, my brother. Leave your sorrows and come along and go with me. Nothing could cause us to turn back in this race because we're bound for regions of everlasting song. Jesus abundantly supplies us with grace. Leave your sorrows and come along and go with me. Why should she and children not come and be sad? Let's lift our voices in happy duology. Things are not bad. Things are not bad. My brother, leave your sorrow and come along and go with me. Why should she and children not come and be sad? Things are not bad, things are not bad, my brother, leave your sorrow and come along and go with me, leave your sorrow and come with me. Ten yards split at 1.54 seconds, you know all that. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxious and waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. I make plans and I'm taking the journey. Why don't you come and go while there's still room? Now I've already made my reservation on this flight that is leaving soon. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxious to wait in for this flight that is leaving soon. I'll be going when I hear that last trumpet with the bride awaiting for the groom. And the time is at hand for my departure on this flight that is leaving soon. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. All I know is I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. All I know is I'm anxious to wait in for this flight that is leaving soon. For this flight that is leaving soon. And a good Thursday morning, everybody. Chris McDonald with you as we <coughs> wrap up a <coughs> another week of Bible studies here on our Mac Files Faith Network. We're only on the Faith Network this morning, and we from time to time open up the news network to these. But today, I just wanted to come on and stay on the Faith Network with you. And uh, we're grateful that you're here. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. We're going to be leaving for South Dakota this afternoon. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll keep us in your prayers. Looks like we've got some weather we're going to be driving through this afternoon. And uh, we'll be doing it in two parts. We'll be doing probably three-fourths of the trip 
today and then we'll have about another four or five hour trip tomorrow it's not a easy track from here to south dakota from the hills but um we're going from the hills of east tennessee to the black hills of south dakota so uh looking forward to being with everybody up there and uh so forth and uh we hope that you can be with us if you're in that general area we start tomorrow night at seven and then saturday at 10 2 and 7 and then sunday afternoon we're going to have a special communion service and a passover service sort of a com combination we'll definitely have communion and we'll do a little teaching on the passover and uh, we may even take some questions sunday we may do a q a with the folks that are there but sunday is sort of a wrap-up day we normally don't do sundays on these conferences we we've been we prayed about this and the sundays were uh, people had to travel and uh it was just sometimes they were the least attended and uh it's hard for folks to come out on Sunday afternoon. So we just decided we were going to do Friday and Saturday. But in this case, and thanks to Amy Miller for helping us secure the hotel for an extra day, it worked out because we got Passover weekend, and we're going to do that for Sunday up there in South Dakota. I don't know what that sound was coming in. It's good to see everybody in the house. Uh, Mark Rarer, good to see you out, Dory. Good to see you, dear, this morning. Uh, Fedelina, Patty, Suzanne, Susan, Joanne. Jimmy, Sheila Daspert, good to see you there, all of you, and Joe, uh, Carol Smith's in the house this morning, and good to see you as well. Jimmy Lemons, good to see you, buddy. We're grateful for you to be with us. Now, we were talking yesterday in great detail out of the 17th chapter of Revelation. We're talking about the religious power and the religious influence that is going to be over these ten kings and really that has been over the empires of the past, all seven of them. And you can really say eight because the eighth kingdom is really what John is centering in on in Revelation 17. It's what he's centering in on in Revelation 13. It's what he's centering in on in Revelation 12. Um. I'll just say this too. We we will be re, we will be sort of circling back around these things uh, on our Wednesday night Bible study because we're going through Revelation right now. We're, we're going to be on Revelation for a long time. We're just in Philadelphia right now, and we've got some in-depth studies coming. We're going as slow as we can uh, for a reason. Um, I have taught Revelation a few times, probably three, maybe four times in my life. To churches and we've rushed through them quite rapidly and uh, this time has been different and I'm glad it's been a little different it's been very in-depth and uh, we're hoping if we can get somebody to um, help us with this we're going to try to put a book together uh, with these lessons and these outlines maybe an outline form and uh, but that's my issue, not yours. But we're going to try to put this in a written form for you at some point. We do have a website, spiritjournals.org. When you go to spiritjournals.org, it takes you to the blog. But if you click that home page on, it takes you to our Mac Files Faith website. And uh, and then Mac Man Music's the music site. But we are hopefully... When we get back, we've been sick. I planned to have all this, had had all some of this done already, but this sickness sort of delayed things a little bit, like it always does. And um, but hopefully we'll have this in a written form for you. But there are outlines. Some of these outlines are already up. This this main outline for this study is there on spiritjournals.org. If you've not gone there, and then go to the uh, Spirit and Word Bible Study Hour link, you'll see the links. Uh, to the to the outlines that we've been showing you and a few that we're going to do today We'll hopefully have them up uploaded by the first of the week All right We've been talking about this eighth kingdom because this eighth kingdom is going to be the beast kingdom um, We are um, Studying right now though the another aspect of this that probably is the most important aspect of it and that is 
the, the power behind it is not only a fallen angel that will come out of the abyss to control the Antichrist, but for the first three and a half years, these ten toes, which represent ten kingdoms, um, and they were seen as ten horns on the beast of Daniel 7, and also they were narrowed down to four horns in Daniel 8, that represents kingdoms, they are controlled by this woman that sits on this beast that's scarlet colored. She's decked with gold. We read this yesterday. She's decked with all sorts of jewels, all sorts of gold. She's got this golden cup in her hand that's full of abominations. And on her forehead, we're going to read this. We're going to deal with Mystery Babylon next week. I don't want to get into it today. We got. I want to just sort of sum this up to this point this morning. But she is seen as sitting on many waters, and people have argued this over and over, that this has been one of the most misunderstood and, mis and hardest to be under understood passages in Revelation when it comes to the end times, because that woman has been made out to be Rome, it's made out to be a number of things, and there's, again, when you don't take it in context and you look at it and look at pieces and define the pieces and then look at the whole, then you can get sort of confused and it's easy to do that. I'm not saying this study is easy. It's not for the faint at heart, but I don't have any problem teaching it. I, I feel like it needs to be taught. It needs to be understood because if you can understand this, it's going to keep you out of a lot of false doctrine. It will. And it will help you understand the things that are coming on the earth. And when you start hearing all these fallacious things and these wild things out there and these conspiratorial things, you can reject it outright because, you know, well, that, the Bible don't say that. And that's really the reason why we're doing it. And John, through the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit through John, tells us that there's a special blessing that comes to those that read this prophecy, that keep this prophecy, and hear this prophecy. And he's speaking directly of Revelation. And then God puts a warning on that at the end. He says, whoever adds to this or takes away from from it, he said, there's going to be a curse. We're going to, I'm going to literally add the curses of this book to that individual. And then if they take it away, he said, I'm going to take their part, that part of their name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. That's dangerous. That's a dangerous warning for people not to placate and play around with this book. So we don't do it arrogantly. We don't do it privately. We do it with great humility. We do it in fear and trembling. But I've studied this for 30 years and I have. 40 years almost now, to be frank with you. And it didn't click for me at the beginning. It took me years. And sitting under my dad and reading every Bible, every commentator I could find, uh, there was a few that helped me the most. Um, and then I was sitting at a radio station one day, and I don't know how it happened. I can't explain how it happened. But I was in the middle of this study, and it, the light came on. The light came on about these kingdoms and about these images and about this this whole narrative of Revelation as it tied to Daniel. And when I realized that a lot of what you're witnessing in Revelation, it is chronological, but there are pauses where the Holy Spirit just stops. He just stops. And he explains something that it may seem out of context at the moment. It may not seem that that fits here, but in reality it does fit. Because what he's doing, he's explaining to you some of the things in that chronological time, but you have to understand these parenthetical. That's what we call them. It's a parenthetical passage. And it's pauses. They're pauses. And he puts these out there in depth, in depth, to get us to see the overall picture of what is being said and what's coming. Uh we know that this is going to take place in the midpoint of the tribulation because these kings have given their power to the beast. And we have seen that in Revelation 13 where they're seen, where the beast is seen with the crown on his head um, and great power. And Satan has, let me get my whiteboard out, these kings right here, this is what is being controlled by this great woman. And that's what John is actually seeing. He's seeing that this coming kingdom, this coming kingdom of ten nations formed within the old Roman Empire territory, they're going to be under the influence of this 
entity, whatever you want to call it, right whore, whatever you want to call it. But it's organized religion. And it's not just one religion. It's all religions. It's all that are opposed to God, all that do not adhere to the truth. And folks, the only truth that matters is Christ and Him crucified. And even apostate Christianity, even corrupt Christianity is thrown into that mix. It, it speaks of the apostasy of the <coughs> modern church. Uh, <clears throat> it speaks to the fact that all false religion has had some kind of hand in these kingdoms through the centuries, through the millennial. I told you yesterday, it, it, if you look back at the wars, if you look back at all the great conflicts of history, for the most part, they've always been tied to religious arguments. You, you can look and see the influence of religion over most, if not all, conflict that bloodshed has been shed and then you've got the other element of this that apostate religion and false religion has always persecuted the true faith. It's always persecuted the true faith. And whether that's physical persecution, which is very prevalent in many parts of the world this morning, or it's not necessarily physical persecution, it could be spiritual persecution, it could be financial persecution, it could be a persecution in a number of ways, and and folks, look, I hate to say this, and it's just it's just the reality of it. Look, with the internet and the way people do and the way people are, look, this um, this machine of slander and this machine of lies and this machine of accusation and all this machine that is in play over all the earth right now. Uh, Bishop Mari Emanuel. Um, I, I want to just give a shout out to him this morning. He's recovering. And he he basically, uh, I'll just read it. I'll just read it. Um, he said this morning, he said, You're my son. I love you. And I will always pray for you. And whoever sent you to do this, I forgive them as well in Jesus' mighty name. And it's truly the power of Christ that is perfected in our weakness. It really is. And folks, the power of Christ is perfected in the weakness of the church. The, the church, the true church understands that without Christ, we're nothing. Without Christ, we're weak. When we're weak, we're strong because his strength is perfected in us. And a lot of the true faith is under attack. And a lot of the true faith with this internet world, folks, uh, is maligned, it's mocked, it's debated. As I said, it's like we've, we've turned the church into this World Wrestling Federation match. We've turned the church into this, this uh, I don't even know what you call it anymore. I don't. Uh, people are going to listen to who they want to listen to. People are going to do what they want to do. People can follow who they want to follow. The, the true faith, though, the devil's effort is to keep people away from the truth. That's his effort. It's always been his effort, but he uses these fallen angels, these principalities to do it, and this, this woman that sits on this beast, folks, is the ultimate consummation of all of these efforts by Satan to oppose God's truth and God's plan and God's message and the truth of the gospel and to convince people that there's another way to God and convince people there's another way of deliverance, another way of salvation, and it convinces people that they don't need the God of heaven, that they need religion, that they can go through their religious activity, their religious works, their religious formulas, their religious membership, and they can be okay. They can be saved by doing all that. That's how they view salvation. Many view salvation in that manner. It's false. It's abominable. And that's why her cup is a full of abominations because without Christ, man is an abominable creature. I don't care how religious man is. I don't care how moral man is. I don't care how uh, <coughs> rich man is. I don't care how educated man is. Outside the cross, outside the, the blood of Jesus being on one's life and the power of God being in one's life through the Holy Spirit, without the nature of Jesus, let me tell you something, the nature of Jesus, without the nature of Jesus, Mario Emanuel would not be able to say that. That is being said this morning by the power of Jesus by the power of the true Christ. With no pretense, with no demands, with simple forgiveness. And that's how we all must walk. 
That's how we walk. That's how we do things when things are done to us. And that's the difference in the true church. And I mentioned this yesterday. False religion always fights. It always wars. It always seeks to destroy other faiths that are in competition with it. There's, there's a competition between Catholicism and Islam, Christianity and Islam, Judaism, all these religions, Hinduism, Shintoism. You, you come against these religions, and if you're not part of that religion, they seek to eradicate other faiths. Christianity, true faith, we don't try to eradicate other faiths. We try to be a light, and we try to be a witness of Jesus to those in other faiths. I think Kevin Jessup said it beautifully yesterday, and he was right on target about this. Look, we people go to Jerusalem all the time and these Christians go over there and they're just, they think that they're over there for one reason and that is to convert the Jews to Christ. And folks, you, you ultimately have to, all you can do is love people. Look, I've got friends that are in the Jewish community. They don't know the Lord. And I talk to them and if they bring Christ up, I'll give a strong witness for Jesus, but I don't condemn them. I don't condemn them. I don't sit there and and, 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 and make them feel guilty for being Jewish. And, and I, I don't make them feel guilty for what they believe. I just explain to them if they ask me, they, and I'm more than willing to tell them about my Savior. And I've got one friend in particular, and I never will forget this. And, and they were, we were talking about things, and we were talking about the end times. And I explained to him that Jesus was coming. And he told me, he said, he's Jewish, and he said, well, he said, I believe, <laughs> he said, I believe somebody's coming. That's what he told me. He said, I believe somebody's coming, but I don't believe it's the same Christ you're talking about. And we are friends and we sort of can talk to each other like this. And I just sort of laughed and I said, well, I said, I believe that my Christ is coming. And I said, I'm praying, I'm praying that maybe the Lord will open your heart to that one day. And I told him that day, I remember, I said, you realize that the one you're seeking is the same Christ that saved me. And he stopped for a minute. He paused. I didn't scream at him. I wasn't arguing with him and you're going to hell and you're going to burn in hell and all this. But we had a conversation. We talked and we shared faith. And he said, I pray. <laughs> That's what he told me. He said, I pray you're wrong. He said, because if you're wrong, he said, I've been believing wrong for all my life. That's what he told me. And I didn't say nothing. I just smiled. But I pray for him every day. I do. I pray that the Lord open his heart. Because I know that the Lord's working on him. I know he is. But if I was to be ugly and hateful and mean-spirited and condemn him, I'd lose him just like that. I'd never be able to speak to him ever again about faith the lord does the changing in people the lord is the one that has to open people's eyes folks we can't do that there are some people out there that arrogantly think they can but they can't and it's just, it's just like this massive effort by religion it wants to defend its territory it wants to defend its way it wants to defend its path and look you know we as Christians, apologetics, Jude tells us to earnestly contend for the faith in these last days. And the way we contend for it is we speak the truth in love and we let the Lord do the rest. That's how we earnestly contend for it. We stand up for Christ. We stand up. We're a light. We're a beacon. But I'm going to tell you something we also do, and this is what is missed. It's what Mari Emanuel did this morning, that bishop. Look, he stood up and without anger forgave his attacker literally told him he said i love you son i love you son just like we said yesterday to the muslim world we love you we don't hate you christianity loves you the true christian loves you we're not angry with you and even if you come and you cut my head off this morning i'm going to go to my grave loving you you your hatred that's being driven is being driven by the enemy of all of our souls And it's the same spirit, folks. Let me tell you this. This same spirit is what put Christ on the cross. This woman that sits on this beast, this, this what she represents is the same spirit that was in Israel, this self-righteous spirit, this religious 
hierarchy, whatever you want to call it. There's so many names for it out there. It's ultimately what crucified Christ, and it's what's ultimately has been the source of all the bloodshed of the martyrs, going back from the day of Abel all the way to the martyrs today. And there are millions of them. Religion tries to defend its territory, and it's in competition with other faiths. Christianity, true faith, ain't in competition. True faith is not in competition. True faith is not in competition. And that's why this idea and this fallacious idea that the church is destined to control the earth and take over the world. Folks, the church can't take over the world. This world is under a curse. This world is under the control of Satan. And the only one that has the power to do that is the Christ, the, the Son of the living God. And, and until he comes back, that reality is not going to be made right. But I will tell you this, what's interesting about this story that I'm telling you about this woman, God is going to use the man of sin, even though he is as evil and wickeder than sin, he is going to use this man, this same beast that this woman rides on, is going to turn and burn her with fire. And... When we get to mystical Babylon next week, we'll explain this a little bit more in detail because it, it gets people confused about Babylon and mystical Babylon and regular Babylon and all that. And we're going to get into that a little bit next week. We're going to be in Isaiah 13 and 14. <coughs> While I'm gone, that's your homework assignment for this weekend. Isaiah 13 and 14. Religion, religion sits on people. It's, it tries to control people. But it's also very violent and it's very rich. It's very violent and it defends its territory. Whatever territory it has and controls, it seeks to hold on to it and control it through intimidation and manipulation, which is basically witchcraft. It's basically witchcraft. It controls by seeking to keep people under its domain. And it's, it's part of this beast whore system. And all true faith, folks, points people to Jesus. All true faith points people to Christ. All true faith points people to the cross and nothing else. It, 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 it is not Catholic. It's not Muslim. It's not Buddhist. It's not Jehovah's Witness, Muslims, whatever. And at some point, we may even look at a study of some of these faiths to see the difference in them. But it's all controlled by this very thing that we're talking about this morning. Now, let me go. I want to go to our Bible first this morning. And we're going to read this passage we read yesterday. Are you with me this morning? We try to do a little introduction. Are you with me this morning? All righty. Let's see here. Hang on just a second. We're having some problems with the... We had problems last night with this thing. Hang on just a There we go. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the true church there, folks. That's the true church. He loves the remnant. He loves the church, the true body of Christ. He loves the church. To Philadelphia, I have loved thee. I'm going to let them know that bow down at your feet. I'm going to let them know that I have loved thee. He carried me away. This angel that John is speaking to carried him away in the spirit. These are things being seen in the spirit into the wilderness, folks. False religion. False religion will always lead one to a wilderness. It will never lead to life. It will never lead one to life. It will never lead one to life. It will always lead people to a spiritual wilderness of death. Of death, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet colored beast. That scarlet colored, as we talked about, is the bloodshed that has been shed by these religious entities and systems through the centuries, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, let me come over here to my outline this morning. Let me get my glasses on. Let me get my glasses on this morning. So I can see what I'm seeing and see what I'm reading. Give me one minute here. All righty. Now, 
What are those seven heads and ten horns? I know you've heard it said often. But I need to say it again just to help you understand. The seven heads. Come on, Peter. The seven heads. I got us on an outline here. Hang on just a second. Could come up here. There we go. The seven heads represent seven empires that persecuted Israel. That persecuted Israel in the past with the last one yet future. These are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, which is Iran, Greece, and Rome. Those six right there are past. The ten horns represent ten nations that will arise out of the old Roman Empire territory and persecute Israel and is yet future. These ten nations will make up the seventh head, the Roman Empire, which made up the sixth head, was the last of the empires that persecuted Israel before her destruction as a nation in A.D. 70. And it will be part of this old Roman Empire territory that will persecute her again. And when the Ten Horn Kingdom arises, it will shortly persecute her as well. And let me say something about that, folks. The way that it's going to persecute her is through this woman. That's the purpose of this vision in Revelation 17 and 3. John is literally seeing the, the, the literal persecution that's coming to Israel as a result of these ten kings. And now, I want to just stop here and say something a little bit about this because it's important to understand this. I mentioned a while ago that this is a mix of religions. Catholicism, Islam, Shintoism, whatever. Of all the religions out there, that persecute Israel the most, you could argue that Islam is probably the most violent because Islam in its charter and its wording literally calls for the destruction of the Jews. There are anti-Semitic people in the Catholic Church, without a doubt, and the, and, the, and the Pope, the one that's currently there now, does not like Israel. He's got nothing but bad things to say. He never condemns terrorism when it comes to Israel. It's always Israel, Israel, Israel needs to do this, 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 this. He's never... <laughs> I don't think I've heard him say a pro-Israel thing in his life. It's always pro-Islam. Islam controls about two-thirds of the Middle East right now, probably more. I would say almost three-fourths. Of all the religions that persecute Israel, Islam, you could say, is the leading one with the most blood on its hands. But don't think the Catholics have not had their blood on their hands too in true faith because Catholics persecuted Christians, Islam persecutes Christians, and and I know people claim that Judaism has persecuted Christians. To be frank with you, the persecution of Judaism of I me mean, by the Judaic uh, folks to Christians have been very mild compared to what Islam and Catholicism has done. I talk to Vijay, I mention him all the time. Hinduism, very, very virtuent, very, 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 very anti-Semitic, very anti-Christian. One of the most uh, dangerous, uh, violent religions. If you, like those Hindus, you think the Muslims are rough, those Hindus catch you, your eyes are probably going to be gouged out or worse. I mean, they, they go, they take torture to another level in their persecution of Christians. They do. And, um, they, um, that has been the spirit, that has been the attitude against Israel for a long time. Well, these ten kings, wherever these nations are going to arise out of, will probably be controlled by both Catholicism and Islam, but probably mainly Islam. And that is why I believe John sees them persecuting Israel like he does in this woman, this woman being seen as a beast. But she's a religious figure. Don't make any mistake about this. She's not a political figure. She's not one of the kings. They have committed fornication with her. And we talked about this yesterday, her being decked out with gold. You could argue that that is possibly the wealth of the oil and how the kings of the earth have literally sold their soul to this spirit of Islam over the oil because Islam controls much of the oil in the Middle East, probably 60% of it. And it's why 
us being in oil independent in this nation is so important because we're not subject to Islam's decrees. And folks, if you want to know why President Biden is doing what he's doing to Israel, it ain't. It, it's not hard to see because he's cut off our own oil. We got to depend on the Middle East oil. And if he goes out there and sides with Israel too much, the Arab world's going to cut the oil off. That's what they did to Jimmy Carter. Went right after Jimmy Carter, or right around the time that he brought Egypt and Israel together. And I don't give him credit for that. There was a lot of concessions that Israel had to make in that treaty. And Carter pressured him. And Carter did some very, very bad things to Israel behind the scenes during his four years. Very bad things. Just like Biden. And, uh, <coughs> but they did the oil embargo. And I remember as a child, I vaguely remember the long lines. And this was um, not good. It's not good for our country. And, um, but those things are, are coming back. But the reason they can happen to political nations is that they are committing fornication with the spiritual force behind that entity. And that spiritual force, folks, is the oil. It's, it's the oil. It's the money that this religion generates. Religion is always wealthy. False religion usually is wealthy. It doesn't mean money's a sin, but there are, is great money in false religion. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. You've got to have money to live on, folks. You've got to have money to feed your family and pay your light bill and pay your car payment and things like that and survive. Money, money, money is not evil. The love of it is. The pursuit of it is. What's done with it is. If good's being done with it, that's not evil. And, but the thing is, is that the world's controlled by it. And many people that are greedy are controlled by it. And people that are, um, you know, um, nations are controlled by it. Nations are influenced by it. Nations are blackmailed by it. America's being blackmailed right now by the Middle East because we've always been blackmailed by the Arab world that if you don't tow our line and you don't tow our hatred to Israel, we're going to cut your oil off. And that's how this influence. So you can see how that that influence is going to drive these kings to persecute Israel again. She's going to be persecuted hardly for three and a half years. Now let's go back to our Bible now. And I want to read this. And then we've got an outline I want to show you real quickly this morning before we let you go for the week. And we'll pick this up next week while we don't finish. We're going to get into Mystery Babylon next week. It's going to be some good stuff. But the seven heads and the ten horns, that's, again, what that represents. These names that's on this woman are full of blasphemy, are full of blasphemy. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet color. I mentioned to you the purple means kingship. It means dominion. She has dominion over these kings. She's not one of the kings, but she has got influence over them. The scarlet color indicates the... Persecution, the bloodshed that has been shed in defending her territory. She's very territorial. Decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And pearls. And she has a golden cup in her hand full of her abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, the way we know that she is a spiritual figure, a religious figure... And this is what we're going to deal with next week. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The way that we know that this Mystery Babylon is not literal Babylon, it's not a specific city, but it is a spirit, is shown to us in many different ways. And I wrote this out for you this morning, and I want to show you this as we... Write this, and this this outline here that we've got up this morning, it'll be on the website, hopefully, by uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week. I can't do it today. But we'll definitely have it up there by the first of the week. But I want you to look at five quick things with me, six things real quick with me this morning, that indicates this woman is a spiritual force. Whenever you see the term whore in the Bible, and you ever see the term play in the whore, and that's 
And a lot of these passages that I've got here listed right here, Revelation 17, 1 through 4, Isaiah 23, 17, Isaiah 57, 3 through 7, Jeremiah 3, 2 through 9, Ezekiel 16, 1 through 63. Ezekiel 20, 30 through 32. Ezekiel 23, 7 through 49. Hosea 4, 12 through 19. Nahum 3 and 4. Whenever you see that term there, it's always symbolic. That refers to religious fornication and idolatry. Even though that there are references in those passages that spoke of literal fornication that was rampant in Israel and adultery and sexual perversion, homosexuality, bestiality, whenever they forsook God, that's what controlled them and ruled them. And it always led to spiritual idolatry. Never forget this, folks. Never forget this. I'm going to come back over here and say something about this this morning. Very important to understand. All religious, listen to me, all religious whoredoms, all religious fornication, all spiritual fornication, all false religion always leads to idolatry. There's no exceptions. Idolatry is the end game of false religion because what idolatry is, what's idolatry? Idolatry is worshiping any God other than the true God of heaven. Idolatry is, 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 is worshiping, giving to, uh, being influenced by any other God than the God of heaven. I'm going to use this as an example. When people turn to psychology, instead of turning to true faith to help them with their spiritual problems, folks, that's spiritual fornication. Because what you're saying is that, okay, I'm married to Christ, but I don't want to trust Christ for my deliverance. I want to trust something else for my deliverance. That'd be like me being married and, or you being married, your spouse, and you uh, say, I'm married to you, but... You go have sex with somebody else and tell them that I need my needs fulfilled from somebody else because they can fix my problem and you can't. I know that sounds pretty intense and adult. We're adults in the room, but that's how it is. Well, let me tell you, let me bring that down to you spiritually because there, that we would, we would scream that that's just abominable and that's just absolutely horrible and no marriage would survive. The spouse would leave. Well, let me, let me bring that down to you in spiritual terms, folks. That's how Christ feels. When we take our faith, when we take our faith off of him, we say, well, we're saved. We're married to Christ. We say, well, we're part of the bride of Christ. We're part of his bride. And yet we take our faith and we put it in other things. And we don't trust him for our life. And we don't trust him for our sustenance. And we don't trust him. But we go out and trust the world system and the world's ways. We trust religion. We trust religion. We trust religious works. We trust religious formulas. We trust religious schemes. We trust all these false religions. We trust everything other than Christ and the cross. We take our faith away. We commit spiritual fornication. We commit spiritual fornication. And I'm talking to believers. I'm, this, this world doesn't have any clue what I would be talking about this morning. I'm talking to children of God. Well, John is seeing this woman as a whore. And, this, and the connotation behind what he's seeing is this. The kings of the earth have worshipped her. And in committing spiritual fornication with her, they have worshipped her as well. They've worshipped her wealth. They've worshipped her power. They've worshipped her influence. They've worshipped her. And they've bowed down to her needs. She sets on those people, folks. She sets on that beast. And she sets on many waters for a reason. She controls nations, empires. She's always been that. But she's when you see the word play in the whore in Scripture, it is always speaking of a spiritual nature. Not let me, let me caveat that a little bit. There are passages that I just gave to you, and I'll put that outline back up so you can write those scriptures down while I'm talking. There are passages in those scriptures there that do speak of physical fornication, but the connotation the connotation is spiritual fornication and religious fornication that always leads to idolatry. Anything that takes the place of your devotion to Christ, folks, anything 
that takes our devotion away from God, ever, anything that takes our devotion away from Christ and the cross, anything that removes our faith from the true God is idolatry. Let me say it real quick. I've got to come back over here one more time and say this. I'm, I'm in good shape. I've got about 15 minutes. Listen to me. It's not just saying I believe in God because everybody, the world believes in God. Let me tell you something. This 10 toe confederacy, this woman has gods attached to it. This woman has gods, plural, attached to it. But it is in opposition, the spirit, to the one true God. And you say, how do I know the one true God? It's as simple as the nose on my face. But it's yet so complicated for so many. You know Christ. Christ is the expressed image of the Father. He said over and over and over and over and over, time and time again to national Israel, that was so caught up in their religion, so caught up in their ceremony, so caught up in their schemes, so caught up in their own righteousness, their self-righteousness. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you say you believe in God, you'd believe in me. If you say that you love God, you'd love me. You would recognize that I've come from the Father. They would have recognized God. They would have recognized him as God, but they didn't. They accused him of every name in the book, and they accused him of being false, and they accused him of, of every sort of blasphemous act. They even got to the point, they went to the very point of saying he, the miracles even that he was doing, was, they were being done by the power of Satan. Blasphemed the Holy Spirit when they did it. They were blaspheming the Holy Spirit when they did it. The way you know the true God is through the true Son. And there's only one Son. And there's only one God. And there's only one way. There's only one truth. <coughs> there's only one Holy Spirit. There are not several spirits that many people are being influenced by. And this adulterous, whoring spirit that John sees sitting on this beast, folks, that's what it does to nations and empires. It leads them to spiritual idolatry away from the true God. The gospel points you and I to Christ and the cross. That's what it points us to, and the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of the cross and nothing else. Number two, the way that we know, the way that we know that this is a spiritual entity is that her causing the many nations to commit fornication with her proves that idolatrous religious practices are being referred to. I just mentioned that. She, she would cause these nations and causes these kingdoms to commit spiritual and religious idolatry. Idolatry. Number three, she's not a political figure because she's not classed as one with the kings of the earth. She only causes the kings and the inhabitants of the earth. And let me sort of bring this in a little bit closer so you can see that I got cut off there hang on just a second um, she only causes the kings and inhabitants of the earth to be drunk with the wine of her fornication we read that in Revelation 17 2 and we've read that just now in Revelation 17 4 since fornication here refers to religious harlotry then her influence over the nations is through false and apostate religion. She's not seen as one of the kings. She is seen having fornication with the kings. Number four, and this is very important, the beast, the beast, which this woman rides, which this woman rides is the eighth kingdom made up of the many waters or peoples inside the old Roman Empire territory we've just talked about. Since the beast itself is the kingdom, the woman must be religion, dominating the kingdom until she's destroyed by it. The attire of the great whore identifies her as a religious system. 
or as a whore committing spiritual fornication, duping political powers by her whoredoms and idolatries. The purple scarlet, precious stones, pearls, and golden vessels indicate the wealth, indicate the wealth of this system. I want you to look at Ezekiel with me this morning, Ezekiel 23, 40 through 41. I want you to look at this real quick. Hang on just a second here. Ezekiel 2340. <clears throat> Actually, we need to go back to this. Moreover this they have done unto me, that they have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbath, for when they had slain their children to their idols. Then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, this they have done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from far unto when a, whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came for whom thou didst wash thyself, painted thine eyes, and decked thyself with ornaments. And settest upon a stately bed and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil. He's speaking of Israel, folks, right there. He is speaking about Israel when she was under judgment of playing the whore with other nations and playing the whore like a harlot would do, inviting male lovers into her. And the system, the system of this religious system, folks, is the same. The spirit behind it is the same. The wealth is intoxicating. They're drunk. They're drunk. They're drunk with this fornication. The kings are of the earth, and they will be in the revised Roman Empire. The golden cup in her hand, full of her uncleanness, the spiritual fornication and abominations, by which she dukes political powers, but proves to her to be a religious power. Proves for her to be a religious power. I want to come back over here, and I want to go to Ezekiel, the same passage in Ezekiel, and I want to look at <coughs> verse 29. And they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away thy labor, and shall leave thee naked and bare. And the nakedness of their whoredoms, of thy whoredoms, shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen, and because thou Thou art polluted with their idols. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister. Therefore, I will give her cup into thine hand. What is the cup that God is referring to here? This passage here is speaking of national Israel at the time of Ezekiel, but it's got reference. It's got reference to this woman that's going to have a golden cup in her hands, full of an abomination, and she's going to be persecuted by this woman with this cup. Hang on just a second. We've got to freeze here again. Hang on just a second. Hang on. Just there we go. I want to come back over here to our passage in Revelation, and then we're going to wrap this up. I want you to look at this right here, folks. We're going to talk about this next week. More. She had a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness. And filthiness. Filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name. Mystery Babylon. The Great. The Holy Spirit calls her the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Little spoiler alert. Little spoiler alert. We're going to deal with this because we're going to go through Revelation 17. We're just dealing with this verse by verse. But I want you to show, show you this right here. John is being told that the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are people, 
multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate her, hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Let me tell you where we're headed with this next week. This spirit of mystery Babylon that has been on the earth. By the way, a little Bible nugget this morning. The two cities in the Bible that are spoken of the most is Babylon and Jerusalem. Jerusalem is God's city. Babylon has always been Satan's city. Babylon is where the first organized rebellion of man took place with Nimrod, the plains of Shinar. Iraq has played a very huge role in the Bible throughout its history. Babylon is the devil's city. Jerusalem is God's city. But where we're going with this, folks, as I just read this to you, God is going to cause these ten kings. He's the one that puts this in their mind to do it. And they are going to give their kingdom over to the beast at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation. Organized religion will be destroyed. Mystery Babylon will be destroyed. And physical Babylon will as well. And when the beast takes full control over the earth, basically the, 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 the region of which he rules, is when he will take his kingdom from the plains of Babylon and he will go and set his kingdom up in Jerusalem, build an image, require the whole world to bow down and worship that image. It is at that time that I believe that what that passage means is that all religion, all religion will be outlawed but the worship of the beast. Now, I know there's been some questions about is he going to be Islamic? Is he going to be a Jew? Is he going to be whatever? There are indications that he could be a mixture of all of it. I'm going to read you a passage next week in Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit addresses the king of Babylon. It's what he's called. It's one of his names. He's called the king of Babylon. The Antichrist will be over these ten kings at the first, but when they give him when they give him their power fully, he's going to move his headquarters to Jerusalem, invade Israel, and defeat her militarily for the first time and set up an image. He is going to burn this whore with fire. They're going to burn this whore. They will renounce this religion and she will be no longer an influence over the earth. It will all be beast worship for the last three and a half years. And that dynamic that I just read to you folks has to do with this eighth kingdom. This eighth kingdom that's coming on the earth. Now, a couple of things. What I read to you in context is going to take place in full in the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, but the spirit of that issue right now is going on this morning. That great horror is influencing the earth right now. And it's influencing millions and billions. I would, let me change that to millions. It's, it's billions of people this morning. Billions. Folks, if, if the Lord came back right now and did an account and we had the judgment right now, do you realize that five billion people would probably instantly go to hell because they're under the influence of false religion? And I don't say that with any glee, folks, but I'm just saying that's just the dynamics of the world right now. False religion controls five-sevenths of the world's population. Another billion people don't have any religious affiliation. They don't even care about religion. They have no religion. They're atheists, agnostic, whatever. They don't care about religion. You could say that's probably more. And then maybe there's a billion Christians out here. But even within that billion of Christianity, there's an apostate church that is producing corrupt Christianity. It's not the true faith. And that remnant is so small, you probably can't even shake a stick at it of the true faith. That's the state of the nations of the world. And the reason that the nations are like that is this very figure that I've been talking to you about for the last week or two is this woman that sits on this whore. I just read to you the passage in 17 and 15. She sets on nations, tongues, tribes, and peoples. That's what she does. And that's sad because it's going to get more and more pronounced as we get into the coming tribulation period all righty now 
It's been good to be with you this week. If you got a question or a comment, if you got a question or comment, put it in the house. Outdoor, good to see you this morning, dear. Good to see you, my friend. We love you. Appreciate you for putting those scriptures in for us. Blessings, buddy. Blessings. Um, any questions? Carol Smith says, Don't let anything or anyone come between you and Christ and the cross. Keep your eyes and heart on Christ. Carol, that is well said. And that is what the influence of the great whore tries to do. She tries to take mankind away from true devotion and true love of Christ. Ultimately, that's what she tries to do. She tries to offer man an alternate way to God and an alternative way of faith. Alternative way of faith, she does. MacFossForum at gmail.com for questions. Any question, real quick, we've got, uh, it's 59 minutes. i got a couple of minutes, but then i got to get out of here. Any questions? Lane Willard, glad you're able to join today, too. Good to see you today. Joe, I'm going to mention your comment about being in the remnant is very humbling. Look, remnant is not a title of a group. It's not a title of a group. I, I, I hate to tell you, I mean, and I'm, I'm not saying this to you, Joe, but I, I, I've seen people out here that have literally made the remnant like out as like a little mini cult. That there's this little special group on the earth that we're this remnant and we're this and that. And they put all sorts of titles on the remnant. And that's no different. That's no different than every other religious group out there because people have turned the remnant into a religion. The one thing that binds us is the faith. Faith in Christ and Him crucified. To be frank with you, nobody knows who's in the remnant. Only God knows that. Only God knows that. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. I understand what you're saying, but I would caution all of us this morning, all of us, to be careful about these little labels of these groups. And I've watched the body of Christ. I've seen it. I've seen it out there. And even the remnant has now turned into this little cult-like thing that we're the remnant and no more. And nobody else is part of our group except the remnant. Folks, the remnant's job is to go out and be a witness and a light to the world of Christ. It's not some little catch em all country club. We're to be out witnessing and out being a light to Jesus. What Bishop Maury Emmanuel, he don't probably will. He he probably does. He's a Syrian Orthodox. Down in Australia, down under. And uh, what I would do to get that man on this program. <laughs> but I'd love to meet him one day in person. Look, what he did this morning was true faith. True faith. You see, we think true faith. The church has turned the true faith thing into, well, there's people going out there and, and with a sword and, and fighting the devil and removing all the evil on the earth and removing the evil from the church and removing the evil from this and that and the other. Folks, let me tell you something. The church in itself can't remove evil. You can't go into the hearts of men and remove evil. No church can do that. No movement can do that. The remnant can't do that. Only Christ can. And the humility that comes with the grace of God, you know what the humility is? is that God puts His power and His grace into such flawed people, into such sinful people that are not worthy of any of it, but by His grace and mercy, He gives us His grace. He gives us His mercy. He saves us by His sovereign act. Look, these things that are with Israel, these things that are going to happen to Israel, folks, are not for her destruction. It's for her redemption. Despite all of her history with God, her rebellion, despite all of her things that she's done to make God so angry with her at times that he's willing to wipe her off the map and Moses had to stand in intercession. Despite all of that, he's going to bring her back. <laughs> he's going to bring her back. And when you think about that, when you think about that, 
That's humbling. Because see, what Israel represents as a nation, folks, ultimately, she represents us. Because we all deserve hell. We all deserve it. But because of God's immaculate mercy and His sovereign grace that He shed on that cross through His Son 2,000 years ago, we can be redeemed. And we are bought with a price. And let me tell you what being bought with a price means. It means He's committed on you inheriting eternal life because you're His property now. And you don't belong to some cult or religion or anybody else. You belong to God and you belong to Christ. And I belong to Him. And that's why Christ alone is the only one that can judge. And when He judges, He judges righteously, but He judges for redemptive purposes, not destruction. And folks, ultimately, the only people that reject God's love, and if you think about it, folks, God is so merciful, even to the sinner. God is angry with the wicked every day, but even that sinner out there that gets up every day and breathes God's air, and he goes out and he experiences the sunshine, he experiences the rain, he experiences the, the goodness of God every day. That's what Paul talked about in Romans 2. He said, it is the goodness and the graciousness of God that leads us to repentance. Look, God is a good God. He's not a tyrant. That's the difference between our God and the God of Islam. The God of Islam has got a sword in his hand, and if you don't adhere to Islam, it cuts your head off. The Catholic's God is a tyrant God. If you don't adhere to the Catholic hierarchy, if you don't adhere to the penance of faith, if you don't adhere to the penance, and you don't adhere to the amends and all this, and you don't go through their process of purgatory, and you don't go through their... <coughs> priest and the Pope and all this. They cut you out. They excommunicate you. That's not how God does His kingdom. The true God of heaven is love. And because He loves man, He has given man a way. He has given man a way to life. And that way has been revealed in this book. That man, that way has been revealed. That man has been revealed. That man. Has been revealed in this book. Praise God. Listen, we're grateful that you've been with us today. And we hope that you will have a good weekend. I will see you in South Dakota starting tomorrow night. Won't be with you in the morning. Can't do it from the car. <laughs> if I could do one from the car, I would. But I don't want to wreck. And uh, we'll be headed to South Dakota this afternoon and tomorrow. Pray for us. If you feel led to give us a little love offering to help with the travel, we greatly would appreciate it. Zell, Chris Mac, 44, gmail.com, paypal.me slash the Mac files. We ain't got any good stuff yet, folks. Be back with me next week. We're going to deal with Mystery Babylon. We're going to talk about Mystery Babylon and what it means because it has to do with this spirit of religion that's on the earth. It has everything to do with this entity that John saw and is controlling several this morning billions of people sadly we need to be a light and remember folks we are part of the true faith we're the body of Christ let's act like it today and love each other out there as he loved us okay I love you have a good morning be blessed put some fire in that house if you got something out of this and just for out Dory West this morning to, to give her Folks in Manhattan and Long Island and all the New York folks, a message that we're getting out of here. This is for her and you this morning. I'll see you guys in South Dakota tomorrow. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting. For this flight that is leaving soon I make plans and I'm taking a journey Why don't you come and go while there's still room Now I've already made my reservation On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready 
It may be midnight or morning or noon Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting For this flight that is leaving soon I'll be going when I hear that last trumpet With the bride awaiting for the groom And the time is at hand for my departure On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxiously waiting For this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxiously waiting For this flight that is leaving soon for this flight that is leaving soon. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, Paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on.